Hi everyone, welcome to the um, gut health workshop. We're going to be learning to make some kimchi and some sauerkraut today. So, and Linda Black Elk is going to be teaching us and giving us all of her knowledge. Thank you guys for signing up and attending. This also is recorded and it will be posted on our YouTube site if you want to follow up and do this later on at home with your others or, or share it with somebody and um, do all that. So welcome Linda Black Elk and go ahead and you can go ahead and take it from here. Awesome, thanks so, so much. Um, yes, we are recording um, and then I'll post the link on my Facebook page for those of you who have to leave or maybe you have to leave early. Um, I know Jen said that she has to go run some errands. So no problem. Um, and, and I know that the Native American Community Clinic um, that, that Anita and them will be uh, posting it on the Facebook page of the clinic, probably, right, Anita? The YouTube channel. It's oh, on yeah. our YouTube channel. Yep. Okay. On the YouTube along channel. With, yep, along with the other videos that you have done. Awesome. Um, so some of you, if you've done other workshops through the clinic, you might have um, actually done one of the yoga classes with Indigenous Lotus. And I know that she talked about the vagus nerve. Um, if she hasn't already talked about that, she will be. And I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the vagus nerve. It's crazy, you guys, how much this is all connected. Um, and so I wanted to talk about that a little bit today and why fermented foods are so important. So um, hi, everybody. For those who don't know me, I am Linda Black Elk. I'm the Food Sovereignty Coordinator at United Tribes Technical College. Um, here in Bismarck, North Dakota, on the homelands of the Ocheti Shakoi, the Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara peoples. And so um, I'd like to give props to them and lift them up today. Um, it's kind of a tough time. I, I can't tell you guys how many people have contacted me for like medicine, for tea, for anxiety and depression, um, uh, and, you know, just for uh, feelings of loneliness even, you know, um, sadness. Um, and, and, you know, Anita and I were talking about this a little bit of go, a little bit ago um, before everyone logged on. And, um, you know, it is the time of year. I mean, like that lack of vitamin D is a real thing and it has a real impact on the way that we feel. Um, I think that, you know, there's just a lot going on in the world right now as well. And that's having a profound impact on the way that people feel. And um, so hopefully we can talk about that a little bit today and I can give you all some really simple ways to kind of fight that, um, to fight those feelings. Um, not just to fight those feelings, but, but you know, to also give yourself a boost um, uh, with something that's not just healthy for your uh, physical body, but for your mind and for your heart, uh, for your spirit as well. So great to be here. I'm actually going to um, share my screen with you first because I want to talk about this, uh, the vagus nerve, like what is that? You know, all of a sudden everyone's talking about the vagus nerve and, um, you know, I think it's important uh, to talk about like what that is and why it's important. Um, so when you are a fetus, okay, when you are still in the womb, um, let's see from the beginning, okay. It always takes a second for um, my laptop to, to show the um, PowerPoint, but uh, when you are in the womb, okay, you start to develop um, nerves, right? Your central nervous system. And that first nerve, that first original nerve that you develop is called the vagus nerve, okay? And from the vagus nerve, every other, everything else branches out from there. Okay. So the, um, you start off with that original vagus nerve and then everything um, branches out from there. Um, and so, uh, but, but the vagus nerve remains. Okay. And it actually, let me show you um, the yellow there. You guys see that the vagus nerve actually connects all the systems of your body. So even the back of your tongue um, where your bitter taste buds are. Did you guys know, have you ever seen a map of the tongue and like where all your different 
you know, where you taste sweet and where you taste bitter and where you taste salty are sort of different areas of the tongue. And your bitter taste buds are actually in the back of your tongue and they are connected to the vagus nerve. Those bitter taste buds are connected to the vagus nerve. And so of course your brain is connected to the vagus nerve. Um, your lungs, your heart, you know, your digestive system, your stomach, everything, the liver. Um, here's my, my friend, uh, Joe Pitawanaquit. He's in Ojibwe and he lives up in um, Ontario. And I just, I just love him. And he's such an amazing person. And so you know, he's taught me a lot. Um, and one of the things that he taught me is like, get this, you guys, see where the tongue, the back of the tongue is connected to the vagus nerve. When, um, when you eat bitter things, okay, that activates the vagus nerve in the back of your tongue and it sends a signal to the liver to dump out all of the stuff that your liver has been holding on to. You know, like everything is kind of filtered. Everything you eat and drink is kind of filtered through the liver and the liver will hold on to that until it gets a signal from your bitter taste buds in the in the back of your um in the back of your tongue so 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 let me let me say this again those bitter taste buds in the back of your tongue okay when you eat something bitter that sends a signal to your liver to dump out all of that yucky stuff that it's been holding on to and in fact your liver will hold on to all that stuff until it gets the signal to dump it through bitter, okay, through bitter, bitter things. So if you never eat anything bitter, if you, you know, if, if you have a colonized diet in which you think like the only things we need to eat, the only things I want to eat are sweet or salty, then your liver will literally hold on to all that stuff that it has filtered out and it won't dump it and release it. When you eat bitter things and you activate um, those bitter taste buds at the back of your tongue, and then send that signal through the vagus nerve to your liver, it dumps all of that out. And in fact, Joe was telling me that traditionally the Ojibwe in, in the middle of the winter, like what kind of bitter things can you be eating? You know what I mean? All those bitter greens and stuff, like you can't really find them too, too often in the winter time. And so traditionally the Ojibwe and, you know, the Anishinaabe in general would take the fluid, the bile, that bitter bile from the gallbladder of fish, and they would squirt it out and sprinkle it onto to fish, onto to meat, and they would eat that. Yeah. So, so like, and, and the crazy thing is, is that, um, I, I was talking to a Lakota elder, um, and, and my, my sister, Lisa Ironcloud, and, uh, they were talking about how the Lakota do the same thing with the bile from the gallbladder of bison. You take that, that bitter bile in the wintertime and you sprinkle it on, on meat or you sprinkle it in, in soup, or even sometimes they were saying you would just drink it and get some of that, that bitter stuff. And um, of course that helps to keep you healthy. And isn't it amazing that, you know, indigenous people have such a connection to, uh, to mother earth, to food, to their bodies, um, that they know that, hey, just because it's winter doesn't mean we can stop eating bitter things, right? And so, um, uh, you know, that's very important. So that, that is all to say that the vagus nerve is super important and it does connect all these systems of the body to help keep us healthy, right? And um, another thing that Joe taught me is that the stomach and the lungs and the stomach and the brain, right? There's this, there's this direct line, stomach, lungs, brain, all connected. So um, people who have a chronic cough, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little more detail on this, but people who have a chronic cough can often get rid of their cough by activating the vagus nerve. Um, and and we'll, we'll talk more about that, but the vagus nerve connects all the systems of our body. Super important. Okay. Now I'm sorry about all the words on here um, and no pictures, but I really want to give you, but before I 
stop sharing my screen. I really want to give you an idea of this pathway. Okay. You don't have to read this. You can just close your eyes and try to picture this pathway if you want. Okay. Why am I, am I talking about fermented foods today? Why am I talking about the gut? If really what I want to talk about is alleviating depression, <laughs> right? And taking care of yourselves. Why, why am I talking about about the vagus nerve, you know? Why am I talking about kimchi? It's because all of this stuff um, it, it is connected, okay? So you guys probably know that fermented foods like kimchi, okay? So here's, this is some kimchi that we made, you know, a few months ago, still good. In fact, even better than it was the day we made it and it's months old. It'll be even better in probably about six months, okay? Um, when I'll use it for soups and things like that. But fermented foods have lots of prebiotics like fiber and probiotics like that good bacteria that's helping to break this kimchi down, helping to break these veggies down, okay? So lots of good prebiotics and probiotics in fermented foods, all right? Those, those prebiotics and probiotics make your gut super happy. All right. When you eat a potato chip, there's no pre prebiotics and probiotics. When you eat a donut, um, the sugar from that donut will actually kill the good bacteria in your gut. Okay. So how do we make our gut bacteria happy again? We eat prebiotics and probiotics. Okay. So you eat kimchi and your, your, the gut microbiome your, your, the, the stuff in your gut is happy. Okay. The stuff in your stomach is, is, is happy about that. They're like, Ooh, yum, yum, yum. I'm going to eat up that kimchi love probiotics. Okay. Um, these happy gut bacteria produce this, um, this stuff called, uh, gamma amino, uh, okay. I'm horrible ab about this, but gamma amino butyric <laughs> uh, um, acid, right? So GABA for short, gamma aminobutyric acid, okay? GABA. And this is a neurotransmitter, okay? So this GABA is in your gut and it actually sends signals to the brain, okay? The, the GABA allows signals to be sent to the brain through the vagus nerve, okay? So you have happy gut bacteria, they produce GABA. The GABA's like, hey brain, you know, uh, maybe you should calm down and turn off for a while, right? <laughs> Sorry, yeah, I know that sounds weird, but it's, it's kind of, you know, I'm, I'm trying to, the, it is all so much more complex than this from I'm sure a medical perspective. And any of you who are medical professionals are probably giggling about that right now, but you know, let's look at it that way. So you have these little critters in your gut. Um, they eat the good prebiotics and probiotics and they're happy. So they produce GABA, okay? And that GABA sends a signal through the vagus nerve to the brain. And it says, hey, you know, like you can calm down. You can like, you don't have to produce all of that cortisone and all that stuff that, you know, is making you stressed, right? Um, so GABA calms that limbic brain, that part of the brain, and um, it, it helps you be calmer and happier. And you guys, this is, so, so one of the primary studies, right? This, there, there have been numerous studies done on this connection. And some of them have even been um, done in, in children, with children, right? They're, they fed children fermented foods and looked at how um, the, the vagus nerve will light up and send signals, uh, calming signals to the brain, right? Um, and so this is totally safe even for kids who might be having issues of like, you know, stress, anxiety, and, you know, just uh, uh, even um, there was one study that I read yesterday actually that connected the consumption of fermented foods with calming um, ADD and ADHD. Okay. So it's, it's all connected you guys. 
But wait, there's more. <laughs> the vagus nerve also connects the gut to the lungs. And so you eat these fermented foods. Um, this, you know, the, these happy critters in your tummy produce the GABA, right? The gamma amino butyric acid, <laughs> uh, which sends a signal to the brain, which also sends a calming signal to the lungs. You know, so if you know someone, I, I actually, one of my dear friends, um, her daughter just had um, surgery to remove a tumor. And as a result of that surgery, um, the doctor was saying that the, the vagus nerve might have been stressed and it was sending a signal to her lungs to cough. Okay. And so she had this chronic cough. So she sorry, had to unmute myself. <laughs> she can, I, I hope you guys can hear me. Um, she started eating fermented foods and it helped to relieve her chronic cough. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, uh, I, I stopped sharing my screen because I just wanted to like, let you guys know that pathway, let you know why we're talking about all of this. Okay. Um, so now we're actually going to get into making some sauerkraut and kimchi. All right. And it's the easiest thing in the world. And I always feel super weird, like having a class to make this stuff because sauerkraut is literally cabbage and salt. Okay, and I actually um, am using a red cabbage today because I couldn't find really good looking organic green cabbage at the store. And um, we grow cabbage every year and we're usually able to get it to last this long, but we've eaten like a ton of it already. <laughs> so we, um, but I did find one medium size head of red cabbage, purple cabbage, whatever you want to call it. Okay. So this is a medium sized head. I've already chopped half of it up and put it in the bowl. I'm going to chop the rest of it just so you guys can see. So I'm going to let you guys take a look at my cutting board. Okay. And, um, cut it however you want, you know, it's totally up to you, your own personal preference. I usually make a V cut to take the, the stem part out of, of there. You can eat that too, though, or put this in with your broths, right? You don't have to throw that away. You could compost it, but I don't know why. So, and I just do one quick chop. And pretty soon I have half of a medium-sized head of cabbage that is shredded. Now, if you... Um, you know, maybe you have a mandolin that you like to use or some other kitchen tool, but this is all I have to start with, okay? Like, this is all, that's all I have to do. Bam, half a head of cabbage chopped. Now, my friend TPZ, uh, some of you guys might know who she is, TPZ Young. She's a beautiful person and she loves to make sauerkraut as well. And she even talks about the fact that she went to ceremony and, um, uh, at the, at the ceremony, they actually said, start eating sauerkraut every day. Um, this was at the beginning of the pandemic. And basically what they were saying is, is that, they're, that our guts have become so unhealthy, our gut microbiome has become so unhealthy that um, it's making us high risk, right? And this is all true, right? And so um, at ceremony, they were saying, eat sauerkraut, even just a spoonful, one spoonful of sauerkraut every day. Okay. Um, and, uh, uh, that, that sauerkraut will help you, um, to be healthier. Okay. Uh, uh, and, and so we've been eating sauerkraut and kimchi throughout the pandemic. I mean, we eat it every day, um, here at my house, but you know, uh, we've been talking to people about eating that every day. Oh, and Kat is saying that red cabbage has more nutrition than green cabbage. That's interesting. I love hearing that. Um, you know, cabbage is such an amazing vegetable. Um, it's so good for you. It lasts a long time and it's super inexpensive. This head of purple cabbage that I'm using costs less than $2, <laughs> you know, which is pretty crazy when you think about, I'm going to be making a ton of sauerkraut with it. Okay. So I'm putting, um, I already have half of this red cabbage chopped. I'm gonna put the other half in here, just kind of break it up a little, okay? This is how easy sauerkraut is to make, just putting my 
cut up. Oh, uh, I was going to say my friend TPZ, not only did she, um, uh, you know, get that message from ceremony about eating sauerkraut during the pandemic, but because she makes it in such bulk, she just buys the coleslaw mix from the grocery store. Okay. And, and if you are, you know, someone who is super busy, that's a great way to save time. Um, and you can find, you know, those organic chopped mixes. So her sauerkraut actually doesn't just have cabbage in it. It has um, carrots and stuff like that in it as well. And if you want to do that and you want to save time, go ahead and do that. Okay. But, you know, it takes probably about 30 seconds to chop up one medium head of cabbage. Doesn't matter what color it is. Okay. One medium head of cabbage. And from there, you guys, it's this easy. Check this out. I have my salt here. It's just, here's my tablespoon. Okay. One tablespoon and two tablespoons. I, I like to put t heaping tablespoons in there. I kind of like my sauerkraut to be a little salty. Um, so I put that in there, okay? <laughs> so it's about two tablespoons of salt. Now, here's the key, all right? All this is is chopped cabbage and salt. That's all that's in here right now. And here's what you do. When it comes to sauerkraut, you massage, okay? That salt is in there. And so now what you wanna do, you really wanna get that salt like into the cabbage. So you start massaging it and that salt is immediately going to start breaking this cabbage down, okay? And you can really, oh, I'm getting salt everywhere. That's okay. <laughs> Cooking is not, you know, uh, a, a neat process necessarily, at least it isn't for me. Um, but you guys see, I'm, I'm actually being really uh, rough with it, <laughs> okay? I'm like really breaking that cabbage down and, you know, it's very good exercise, okay? I can actually feel this in my arms and shoulders. So it's good exercise, all right? And now even, right, I've been doing this for maybe 15 seconds and I want, I want to see if you guys can see that. Can you see already that this cabbage has started to glisten? That's because the cabbage is releasing water already. Even, even just after about 10 to 15 seconds of massaging it, I can see that this cabbage is releasing a lot of water already, okay? Break up some of those larger pieces that maybe I didn't chop up well enough. Make sure that all of that cabbage just has some salt massaged into it. Um, if you have caraway seeds, um, which, which um, uh, Anita sent out little kits and um, she included some caraway seeds in there for you. The reason she did that is because I love caraway seeds in my sauerkraut. So you could add those in and you could add as much or as little as you want. Caraway seeds are actually very good for lung health. Um, you know, we think of all of these these herbs and spices as being um, culinary herbs, but they are all so medicinal, right? Caraway seeds are medicine. Um, they're very good for your gut health and they're very delicious, right? I'm actually using um, uh, ethically harvested pink Himalayan pink salt. Uh, I don't use iodized salt. So thanks for pointing that out, Anita. Um, I don't use iodized salt when I'm making sauerkraut or kimchi. Um, so, uh, so there's that. Okay. All right. And, 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 you know, you'll, you'll see it'll happen. Look at that. Look at how much th this, this bowl was full to the top and it's already breaking down. Okay. And so I'm going to take this, all that I have in here is my red cabbage and my salt. And I'm going to take this and I'm going to set it aside. Okay. Really good stuff. Um, after, after a while, I will take that sauerkraut and I will put it into a jar, okay? I'll show you guys how to do that. But I wanna get started with my kimchi now, okay? I've massaged that for a while. I'm gonna set it aside. We'll come back to it, okay? If you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat, okay? And, and Anita, have there been any questions so far that I need to address? 
just about the just about the salt and okay. we took care of that one so thank um, you for doing that yeah okay. awesome okay so let's get started with our kimchi okay now um if if you guys so again going thinking of my friends who now make a lot of kimchi uh not just tpz but all kinds of friends of mine make um kimchi um you if if all you can find you know I have a Napa cabbage here, N-A-P-A -A cabbage, okay? Um, but if you only have like a um, purple cabbage, if you have cabbage that like is from, um, you know, the garden, whatever kind of cabbage you have, you can use that, okay? Don't, you know, one thing I can't stand is when, when people don't make good food because they don't have exactly those right ingredients that they've read about online, okay? Don't worry about that at all, okay? You can, you know, use what you have around. I've even seen people make broccoli kimchi, right? They've taken their stems of their broccoli and they're, they're making kimchi out of that. It's amazing, right? You can use carrots. My friend Ruth Hall, she makes beautiful carrot kimchi, okay? She's from um, Fort Berthold, beautiful carrot kimchi, okay? Um, so it's totally up to you, but I have a Napa cabbage, all right? And um, think of this, uh, how, how this to me is one sort of like large head of Napa cabbage, uh, and it, it, it weighs about four pounds, okay? All right, and so all I did, I was, I pulled off any like dead leaves, okay? And I'm gonna let you guys watch this again. And, you know, made sure it was clean. Again, I did that sort of V cut here to get the, the stem end out, just makes it easier. Traditional kimchi would keep this whole Napa cabbage, um, they'd only quarter it, but we're gonna cut it into bite-sized pieces. So if you just watch me here, now it's pretty much bite-sized pieces. Okay, that's it, super simple. And then um, we are going to put this into a bowl. Hopefully. <laughs> um, oh yeah, here we go. Okay. Put this into our bowl. Okay, all we did was cut up a Napa cabbage, put it into a bowl, okay? That's all we do. So put our Napa cabbage in the bowl and then guess what we're gonna do? Salt it, just like we did with the sauerkraut, okay? Um, for um, a for a, a head of Napa cabbage that's like a, for, for about two pounds, um, you know, you do about two tablespoons of salt. Um, I was going to try to look at the recipe that um, Anita sent out to you guys uh, to see how much salt. <laughs> um, okay, let's see. I believe it was two tablespoons. Okay, just yeah. making sure. <laughs> I So you guys can tell, I have to like write recipes when I do workshops like this because I never go by a recipe. I just go by like my instincts. And sometimes like, like sometimes I have um, too, too, you know, I'll, I'll, it'll be too salty, okay? Sometimes my kimchi will be too salty. So next time I just use less salt, all right? Please don't think that just because I've been doing this my whole life, just because I've been making kimchi my whole life, um, you know, there's like even a picture of me making kimchi with my mom when I was like two years old at the table, just because I've been doing this my whole life doesn't mean I don't screw it up every once in a while, right? My mom is in her seventies and she even says that she still screws it up sometimes. So, you know, if you add too much salt this time, add a little less next time. Um, and it's not going to be a problem, but we have like, um, you know, for this one large, um, had about two pounds of Napa cabbage, I'm going to add about about two tablespoons of salt, okay? This time I, I, you know, I don't really add as much, okay? Now, here's the, here's the difference, okay? So far, it's kind of like making sauerkraut, right? All I have in here is cut up Napa cabbage and salt, right? So my mom 
if if she were to walk in and saw me like crunching down the Napa cabbage, she'd be super disappointed in me. This is not like massaging the salt into sauerkraut. This is where you just stir it around, right? Like, like I'll show you guys. You're a little, you're just a little more gentle with it. You just want to fold the Napa cabbage so that it all gets coated with salt, okay? Just kind of fold it around so that all the Napa cabbage gets coated with salt, all right? And then check this out, the, the magic of television. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> the magic of television. This is what I did about three hours ago, okay? I cut up, you guys, this whole bowl was filled, overflowing to the top. And all I did was put my two tablespoons of salt over the top and I let it, I stirred it around and I let it sit there. And I want you guys to watch this. Are you guys watching? Okay, I'm gonna stir this around a little bit and then watch this, watch, this is what salt does, okay? This is what salt does to the vegetables. Um, hopefully you guys can see this. I thought it all flowing in. Just one second, I have a bowl down here. So can you guys see all the, look at this. Look at all that water coming off of that Napa cabbage, right? That's what you want. That's the goal. You want um, the, the Napa cabbage to release the water, okay? That's uh, gonna kickstart that fermentation process, okay? So that's it, right? There's, there's some, now, now even right here, you guys, if, um, if we wanted to, like what, watch, okay? See that? Mm. That's, you know, tasting everything. I could put this Napa cabbage and salt into a jar and I basically have Napa cabbage sauerkraut, okay? This is what I'll have in about two weeks. I saw someone asking about how long um, you wait to eat it. I guarantee you, um, Kayla, my kids will be eating this kimchi that I make tonight, <laughs> right? You don't have to wait to eat it, but if you really want to get all of those good um, probiotics in there, you probably need to wait about two weeks, okay? Um, so all we have in here is Napa cabbage and salt, and I drained off some of the water. That's all I did, okay? And now we're going to do what makes it kimchi, okay? I'm going to show you guys how to turn this Napa cabbage into kimchi, okay? Um, in, in, in Korean, the actual language, when you add the salt to the, to the uh, Napa cabbage, it means to kill the cabbage, right? <laughs> so it's kind of what you're doing. You're like wilting it all down, getting all that water out, right? So now we're gonna make our um, our kimchi paste, okay? Um, oh, I wanna. I also wanted to show you guys um, because part of the recipe, I didn't have any orange carrots left from my garden this year. I only had a white carrot, like a yellowish white carrot left. So I've started to chop up this carrot into like matchsticks, okay? I'm going to add that to just right to my bowl, okay? I'm gonna add the, the carrot matchsticks to my bowl with my salted um, Napa cabbage. I also um, didn't have any green onions in my house, but I happened to have a whole bunch of these garlic chives. So I'm using those instead of green onions, okay? But chop up those green onions and I'm gonna add that to the bowl, okay? Um, I also had some daikon radish sitting around, okay? This is part of a daikon radish. My kids love daikon radish um, more than they like Napa cabbage, <laughs> right? My six-year-old uh, Wawikia especially, he loves daikon radish kimchi more than he likes Napa cabbage kimchi. So we tend to make a lot of, we, we cut this daikon radish up into like half moons and then we cut it in half again to make, um, you know, and we just salted it the same way, right? Uh, with a big bowl full, we added a couple tablespoons of salt. And, and watch this, okay? The, even the um, daikon radish, when you salt it, I did this about three hours ago, right? Even this releases a lot of its water and that's what you want, okay? So, if you really like the taste of radishes, you can um, 
you can use um, them in the big pieces like this, okay? Mm. If you don't, you can grate them or turn them into matchsticks, just like you did the carrot, okay? But we really like this, so I'm gonna add these to my bowl, okay? I'm just gonna put them all in there, okay? So let's talk about what we have in here. I have Napa cabbage that's been salted and let, I let it sit around for a few hours. I have um, matchstick carrots. Uh, if, if I didn't wanna cut the carrot into matchsticks because I kind of suck at that, as you could probably have seen, I could easily just grate a carrot and put it in there too, okay? You can totally grate it. Um, so I have the Napa cabbage that's been salted. I have the carrots. I have some green onion actually garlic chives, and I have some daikon radish, okay? That's also been salted and sat around for a while, okay? And so now, what, what spices do I put on here, okay? So you guys have um, a recipe. If you don't have the recipe, um, uh, we can send it to you. But I have some fresh ginger root. And does somebody want to know if ordinary onions will be okay? Um, like the big bulb onions instead of green onions? They're okay and, and absolutely go ahead and use them because it's better than not making the kimchi at all, right? Um, but they will have a different texture. Plus the other thing is, is that bulb onions have more water in them. So you'll notice that, that your kimchi releases more water and you just have to watch it because after a while when those onions release their water, um, if you have it in a, in a jar, it might overflow. Okay, so just kind of watch it so that it doesn't make a mess. But yes, you can. Absolutely. I've actually, um, I, I make uh, onion kimchi just all by itself. <laughs> I don't add anything else. I just cut up onion and salt it. And then I add the, the kimchi uh, pepper powder and ingredients like I'm going to do right now. And it's delicious. Okay, you can ferment anything, you guys. What we're doing right now, you can do this with anything, any vegetable that you have laying around. Like I said, broccoli, onions, carrots. Um, cucumbers. Oh my God. Cucumber kimchi is like one of my favorites. If you've ever been to a Korean restaurant, they often serve cucumber kimchi. It's delicious. Okay. Um, I'm going to teach you guys right now how to make something that I hope you will use forever for the rest of your life, because we have big jars of what we call kimchi paste laying around all the time. And we use it in chili. We use it like chili soup. We use it to make kimchi. We use it to make quick kimchi. We use it to make cheese dip. We use kimchi paste for everything, okay? So like, here's a bowl of the finished product. This is what we're gonna make right now. And um, this is delicious. Like if you, you know, want a quick snack for your kids, you can actually um, use this instead of ketchup to dip like homemade French fries in. Um, <laughs> it's spicy, it's delicious, it's medicine. Um, and it's, it's so good uh, for you, okay? So I have a bowl, an empty bowl right here. And in it, I'm going to add my garlic, okay? I have some chopped up garlic, okay? Make sure to use good garlic, okay? Adding my garlic to the bowl. My husband pre-chopped all this stuff for you guys. So kudos to my husband, thank you to him. <laughs> Um, I have some chopped up minced ginger, right? Here's that fresh ginger root again. Um, do you guys know the trick for peeling ginger already? You probably do, don't you? But I'll, I'll show you real quick anyway. So you have your ginger root here. Do not try to peel this with a knife. It will take forever and you'll cut yourself and it's really tough. Just use a spoon and scrape the skin off, okay? It's so much easier that way. Can you guys see? Yeah, I mean, you just do that. And it also gets in all the little nooks and crannies. So easy to, to do. So that's how you peel your ginger, right? To go from this to this, okay? And then we just chopped it up and minced it, minced it really fine. So we have our uh, garlic in the bowl. We have our ginger in the bowl. You can see I'm measuring super carefully. Um, <laughs> and uh, then this, is called gochugaru, okay, gochugaru. This is coarse red pepper powder, okay? Coarse red pepper powder. Do not get the finely 
uh, the fine powder. Okay, get the coarse red pepper powder, gochugaru. That's, um, you know, I have friends who use cayenne pepper, like from a, from just from Walmart to make kimchi. And that's fine if that's all you have, okay? But I will tell you that it will taste completely different than like, than kimchi that you might get in a restaurant or, or, or whatever, because gochugaru has this like beautiful smoky spice to it um from you know they use very specific kind of chili pepper for this um the other thing is what did i do with that bag of gochugaru well when you when you buy gochugaru from the store make sure that it says no dyes and no preservatives because these days i hate that they're even putting red dye onto um gochugaru it's a it's a crime it's criminal oh thank you dear so anita you guys look she's holding up that bag of gochugaru everyone got some of that okay um in in the kits that she sent out now how much of this do you use um in the recipe i think that, that what that i sent out to anita i think i put three to eight tablespoons the reason that is such a wide range is because some people like really spicy kimchi and some people don't, okay? Um, uh, I don't remember the name. Uh, they, I always just call them um, kimchi or Korean peppers. I, I don't remember the technical name of them, but I can find that out for you and Facebook it to you later. I, I don't remember the, the actual name of them. But in so, this bowl, I have my garlic, I have my um, uh, ginger, and I'm going to add my red pepper powder. I'm sorry, Anita, what'd you say, dear? Did you? I was going to say their kid has two tablespoons of the powder in it for them. Awesome. Okay. Yep. So, so, and that, that's fine. If you go buy your own, you can add more, you can add less. Um, in, in Korea, there's a thing called white kimchi, and it doesn't have any red pepper powder in it. And, and, you know, some people prefer that, especially like for little kids, um, they'll put garlic and ginger in there, but they don't add red pepper powder because, you know, some people, uh, don't react well to it or it hurts their stomach. Okay. I love spicy, spicy stuff. So I probably added about like six to eight tablespoons of gochugaru to my mix. Okay. So all I have in this bowl right now is garlic, ginger, and red and, and the gochugaru. Okay, now at this step, some people like my mom will add fish sauce or even tiny little brine shrimp. I don't like that in my kimchi. I like, I make vegan kimchi. I'm not a vegan, but I eat vegan kimchi. Um, but if you love the taste of fish sauce, if you love that, you know, funkiness that brine shrimp adds to it, by all means, uh, by all means, add some of that. Okay. I do not. <laughs> so instead of using brine shrimp or fish sauce, I actually add a little bit of soy sauce to mine, okay? So I have my stuff in here and I'm just gonna add, you know, not too much. Remember, soy sauce is super salty and you've already salted your cabbage and, and your radish. So if you add too much soy sauce, your kimchi is gonna be too salty, okay? Oh, Forrest, that's a great question. Um, uh, Forrest is asking about bonito flakes. Uh, yes, in fact, my mom loves to use bonito flakes in, in her kimchi sometimes. And what she'll do is like boil it down in hot water basically, and then actually use that liquid. She doesn't put the flakes directly into the kimchi. She more makes like a bonito broth, okay? And she puts that into the kimchi. Okay. Um, so in this bowl, I have my garlic, my ginger, my gochugaru, and some soy sauce. And I'm just going to stir it around a little bit. My mom would use her hands, um, but I'm just going to stir it around a little bit. And it should be like a pasty texture. And mine is a little dry. So at this point, I could add more soy sauce if I wanted, but I'm actually going to add a little bit of water to, to make it into the desired. Um, pastiness okay and I'll, I'll show you the finished um product but i also wanted to say that 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 some people at this step will um take some of their green onion and they'll chop it up okay really small
and they'll add that as well to this um, kimchi paste, okay? I'm gonna just use up the rest of that soy sauce that I had in that bowl. And a little more water. Okay, now you guys, please don't forget this because kimchi paste is like one of the best tools. You can leave it around. It will last like year, a year or two in your fridge. Um, and it's, it's so delicious that uh, every once in a while, <laughs> I'll eat it by the spoonful. It's spicy, but it's so good. And like, if you have clogged sinuses, if you have um, pneumonia and you have a lot of gunk or buildup in your throat um, and your lungs, you could eat a spoonful of this and it actually, um, it's not happening to me because I'm so used to all that heat, but it will make your nose run. It will make um, you cough up stuff. It helps to thin mucus, okay? But I will keep this paste around all, all year long, right? And so my mom's is a little, my mom actually made this for me to bring home. My mom's gochugaru, can you guys see that texture? Um, this is her kimchi paste, okay? So she, she added a little bit of, you know, a little more water than I did. And that's totally fine. Hers is always delicious and perfect, um, <laughs> in my opinion. Um, but mine, here, I'll show you my, mine, okay? Mine is, can you kind of see that, that texture, right? Mine's a little drier than hers, and I, I kind of like it that way. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to take my Napa cabbage, daikon radish, I have some green onions in there, I have some carrot in there, and I'm going to take my kimchi paste and dump it out into the bowl with the veggies. Now, this is where things get a little messy because I have to use my hands to do this. I've never been able to find out a better or more, more efficient way. So I'm gonna get my towel ready here, but okay. All I do is I just start stirring it around, okay? until all of the veggies in the bowl are coated with that kimchi paste mixture. Now, I, I am more gentle here than I would be if I was making sauerkraut because you don't want to like completely bruise up all these veggies, you know? But you wanna make sure that all of that Napa cabbage and, and those daikon radish moons and the carrots and the green onions are all coated with that kimchi paste, okay? If you, um, if you get to this point and you're like, you know what? That doesn't look spicy enough to me. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> but if you, if you thought that, you know, you could make more kimchi paste and add it, add it to this, you know, even now at this step, right? It's not too late. If this is too salty, it's, if you find it, you know, take a, take, a, take a bite of this, you taste it and you think it's too salty, you guys, it's still not too late. You could chop up some more Napa cabbage and add it to here and stir it and let it sit. And it would be fine. It would be fine. It, it, that would help distribute some of that salt a little, a little better. You guys, look, I just made actually a pretty huge jar of kimchi in just a few minutes, right? Um, so, so let's reiterate here. And, and I, I thank you. Um, she, she actually put, put some stuff up there. Um, Anita, do you think maybe, could you post the recipe in the chat, the recipe that I sent you? Um, that might be helpful for, for people. Um, just gonna clean my hands off a little bit here. So all we have in here is salted, um, salted cabbage, salted daikon radish. We have some carrot match sticks and some green onions. And then we have our kimchi paste, okay? What was in our kimchi paste? It's like the easiest thing ever, garlic, ginger, red pepper powder. That's the primary ingredients, okay? 
if you want to add some, uh, you, you guys, have you, have you ever heard like some people even add like ground up pears to their kimchi paste, right? They'll add something sweet, um, ground up pears, ground up apples, you know, maybe a little apple sauce I've heard, um, I've heard of people adding. These days, I've even seen in restaurants where instead of adding fruit like pear or apple, they'll add seven up. <laughs> like the drink, the soft drink, seven up. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, like I would never do that. <laughs> um, and I, I never add white sugar. I see a lot of Korean chefs adding white sugar to their kimchi. And I just, I'm not a fan of white sugar. So I actually don't add that. But if you feel like you need more of a balance for your kimchi and you want it to be a little sweeter, feel free to add, you know, some ground up pear to it, right? Um, which is less sweet than an apple. Okay. So you could totally do that if you wanted. Um, what else could you, could you add to this? You could add more onion. Um, in the spring, when I go out collecting my ramps, my wild leeks, I make ramp kimchi <laughs> and it's bomb and delicious. I actually still have a little bit left in my fridge, um, from last spring. So, so good, but that's how simple it is to make kimchi. And so now what I'll do is I'll actually put it in this jar. It's just an old pickle jar. Okay. I'll actually put my kimchi into this pickle jar and I'll leave it sitting on the kitchen counter. Um, and wa watch this. Okay. I don't screw the lid on super tight. Don't do that. <laughs> um, I actually will just kind of set the lid on there. Right. I just kind of set it on there and leave it on the counter for about two weeks. Okay. Um, and then, uh, I'll put it in the fridge. All right. Um, and we'll start eating it. And, and you guys, I, I hope you realize, you know, um, about six days ago, this jar was completely full. We eat a lot of kimchi in our house every single day. We eat it with eggs in the morning for breakfast. We eat it, uh, you know, with soup for lunch. We eat it with a steak for dinner. If, well, if we could afford steak, holy crap, have you guys seen how much steak is these days? Oh God. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, we eat it breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It's so good and so good for you. And it really, like, if, if you've never had a quesadilla with a little side of kimchi, you're totally missing out. Or you can even put kimchi on your quesadilla and it's freaking amazing. <laughs> Um, you know, and then, I mean, it's like adding just a little bit of medicine to every meal, but it's delicious medicine. Okay. So we'll put, um, I'll be jarring this up, uh, after I get off of here with you guys and that'll be amazing. All right. Now I just want to do it. Oh, yep. Dennis please wants to know, can you add miso instead of shrimp paste? So, uh, Dennis, that's a great question. I would say not, but I'm only saying that because I've never seen anyone do it. Maybe try it and let me know because it's like a little salty fermented funky thing, right? Miso is. So why wouldn't it work? I don't know. But um, miso is its own fermented product. So that could be interesting. So the only reason I say no is because I've never seen anyone do it. Oh, yeah. And, and someone I saw earlier mentioned perilla leaves. Perilla leaf kimchi is one of my favorite things. If you have access to perilla leaves. Um, uh, my, um, my, uh, uh, Marina, I don't know if you're talking about like soybean kimchi. Um, but I have actually, um, seen people they'll soak soybeans and then they'll mix it with kimchi paste and basically make soybean kimchi. Um, I know a lot of people don't like to eat soy, but I love it. Um, I love soybean kimchi too. It's delicious. Um, if I'm doing that, I add more soy sauce to it. Okay. But let me, let me come back to the sauerkraut. Do you guys remember how this looked before? Um, I just want to show you that, that, you know, purple cabbage releases a lot of um, purple water as well. Sorry, I'm trying not to dump it all out. Do you see that? Right? So it's re it releases beautiful purple water. You can actually use purple cabbage to dye eggs. If you, if you celebrate, you know, that holiday with your kids, you can use purple cabbage to dye eggs blue. Um, beautiful dye. But uh, this is it, right? This is my um, sauerkraut. It's all done. I could start eating this immediately almost. Um, I wanna point something out while I'm putting my sauerkraut in this jar because I know that we only have like a minute left, but I wanna say something. Notice that I didn't add 
any, oh yes, I love, to, sorry. Yeah, kimchi on top of bean soup is delicious. Um, notice that I didn't add vinegar to any of this today. Um, Anita, when we were talking about um, this workshop, she even messaged me and she was like, you, you don't add vinegar to any of this? No, vinegar is good medicine and I love vinegar by itself, but it will kill your probiotics in your fermented foods, okay? When you, the acidity of the vinegar will actually kill your probiotics, okay? So do not add them to, you know, uh, go ahead, take a, a spoonful of vinegar every day, you know, make, make it into a salad dressing, whatever you want to do, but do not um, add vinegar to your sauerkraut or your kimchi because it will prevent the lacto fermentation that is so important for your health that is so important for your, your gut microbiome um, and that is so important for sending those uh, good signals to the vagus nerve. Okay, so you guys can see I'm just packing my sauerkraut into, into this jar. Questions, comments, do you have to dump all, out the water? Oh yeah, no, I'm actually gonna pour the water back into this, Brianna. I just wanted to show you what happens um, when you salt cabbage all that water um, comes out of it. But I'm, I'm actually probably gonna add the water back into here um, because I, I, uh, I like the liquid being in there. Um, now, what happens you guys, if you make your sauerkraut and maybe you didn't add enough um, salt or you know maybe you got a weird cabbage or something like that or something happens in your house and, and it molds and it, it, it you know, your, your sauerkraut molds. Oh God, that's always heartbreaking, right? I've personally not had that happen, but if it does just start over. Okay. Don't, don't let that discourage you. Certainly don't stop making sauerkraut just because, um, here I am adding that, that water I had poured off back in to my sauerkraut. Um, don't let that stop you. Okay. This uh, sauerkraut is going to continue to release water. And by tomorrow, um, the, there will be so much water in this jar that, it, that the sauerkraut will be completely immersed in here. And then in two weeks, I'll have delicious sauerkraut that I can put on to bratwursts or, you know, whatever, put it on top of soup, um, all kinds of stuff. Okay. So it will continue to release water. All right, so you kind of want to watch it because um, sometimes it can actually overflow uh, because it will release so much water. Push it down into the jar, then kind of check. Okay, look at that. Beautiful, I love it. Okay, questions, comments. Does the solid stuff being submerged in the water help prevent molding? Yes, it does. And if you wanted to make a brine, um, you know, some salt water to pour over the top, you could, but I always find that it takes a lot longer to ferment that way. Um, you know, this is the, the, the cabbage and the salt is, uh, you know, thousand year old recipe that they've been doing all over the, the world. And so um, that's enough, you know, you don't, don't need to do it, but definitely the more liquid it releases, the um, less likely it will be to mold. Um, uh, do we put the sauerkraut into the fridge right away? No. Raina, I'm going to leave this jar out on my kitchen counter with a loose lid on it, not a tight lid, a loose lid for two weeks before, um, before I put it in the fridge, okay? Um, let's see, any, any other questions? Anita, did I miss any of them? I, my hands are dirty, so I can't um, go back up and look for them. <laughs> um, I am, I'm so honored to have talked to you guys about all of this today. If you have any questions, you can always Facebook, uh, Facebook me and let me know. Okay. And also just for those people that join late, um, this will be posted, um, on the YouTube channel again, later it was recorded and will be posted on the NAC YouTube channel. Uh, 